And so Quraysh tried everything with the Prophet ﷺ specifically. He was the messenger. He's the one who was bringing forth the message of Islam. So he was their target. And so after trying everything, they finally resorted to physically harming him. And so this shows us their enmity and their hostility towards the Prophet ﷺ, where they did not suffice with words, verbal abuse, but rather they also would physically harm him and attempt to harm him. And so in Sahih Muslim, Abu Hurairah narrates that Abu Jahl came to some of the leaders of Quraysh who were sitting next to the Kaaba. And he told them, are you going to allow Muhammad to rub his face in the dirt while you guys are watching? And so what he meant is, you know, this way that the Prophet ﷺ would pray and make him sujood. So he said, if I see him doing that, I'm going to trample over his neck and I will rub his face in the dirt. And so in the narration it mentions that he approached the Prophet ﷺ while he was praying near the Kaaba, and he planned to fulfill his turn. And so he walked up to him, and Muhammad ﷺ was in sujood. And so as he approached him suddenly, they saw Abu Jahl falling back. And waving his hands in the air like someone who is trying to prevent danger that is about to befall him like someone who's trying to avoid some kind of danger that's in front of him and so they went to him and they asked him what happened and so abu jahl said what do you mean what happened didn't you see so they said, no, all we saw was you falling on your back and waving your hands. And so Abu Jahl said to them that there was a trench in front of me and there was fire and there was terror. And so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, those were the angels. Those were the angels. If he had come any closer to me, they would have torn him into pieces. They would have torn him into pieces. And so this is an example of how they tried to physically harm the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Urwa ibn Zubair narrates that he asked Abdullah ibn Amr he asked him about the worst thing that the mushrikun did to, to Rasulullah and so he said and Abdullah ibn Amr was one of the early companions who embraced Islam early on he said I saw Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyud Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid was one of the one of the seniors of Quraysh and he was one of the enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abdullah ibn Amr says, I saw Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid one day come to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was praying next to the Kaaba. And he grabbed his clothes and started to wrap them around the neck of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam trying to choke him. 
So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu saw what was happening and he stepped in and he pushed Uqba back and he said, do you want to kill a man just because he says, my Lord is Allah and he has come to you with proofs from your Lord? أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهُ قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَةِ رَبِّكُمْ This was actually the saying that is mentioned in the Qur'an. Of who? Of the Mu'min from Al-Fir'aun. So the Ghafir, the believer from the family of Fir'aun, said this about Musa alayhi salam. So Abu Bakr repeated his words and said, Do you want to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is Allah and, and he has come to you with proofs from your Lord? So, this is yet another example of how they physically harmed the Prophet. Another incident narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in Bukhari al Muslim is that Rasulullah was praying next to the Kaaba and Abu Jahl came to the leaders of Quraysh who were also gathered and were sitting around the Kaaba and there so happened to be leftover the leftovers of a camel that was slaughtered the day before happened to be nearby. So Abu Jahl, he said to them, so and so has slaughtered a camel. Who will go and pick up the guts, the intestines of the camel and dump it on Muhammad while he prays? So the narration mentions that Ashqal Qawm, the most evil of those who were present, and he happened to be a Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, the same individual who tried to choke the Prophet He said, I will do it. And so he took on the challenge, and he went, and he grabbed the insides of the camel, the intestines, and he came, and he waited until Rasulullah got into the position of sujood. And then when he did, he dumped it on his shoulders and on his back. And so Quraysh, they saw what was happening. They all started to laugh and they fell over one another laughing while Rasulullah continued with his sujood as if nothing happened. Ibn Mas'ud, the narrator of the hadith, he says, I was watching. And had I had the power, I would have gone and removed it from his back. But Ibn Mas'ud was one of the one of the weaker companions. He didn't have that much power or support. And so some of the companions they sent for Fatima radiallahu anha, who was a small girl at that time. And so she came and she picked up all of the dirt from her father's back. And then she turned towards Quraysh and started to curse them. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam completed his salah, he made a dua publicly against Quraysh. In front of him. Because in the end of the day, he was a human being. And he doesn't have the physical power to defend himself at this stage when the Muslims are weak. But he did have the power of dua. And this is a weapon that many of us you know, we are negligent of when we are weak and we are outnumbered and outpowered and we see the atrocities that are being committed against Muslims around the world. 
and we think, what can we do? And we have no power. We do at least have the, the greatest weapon, and that is the weapon of dua. So the Prophet وسلم, he said, O oh Allah, punish Abu Jahl, Rutba ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Al Walid ibn Rutba, Umayya ibn Khalaf, and Rutba ibn Abi Mu'id. Rukba ibn Abi Mu'id. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua against seven people. But these were only how many names? Six names. These were only six names. Abu Jahl, Rutba ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Al-Walid ibn Rutba, Umayya ibn Khalaf, and Rukba ibn Abi Mu'id. The narrator of the hadith was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the one narrating this incident. He said he forgot who the seventh was. And then he says at the end of the hadith, I had seen with my own eyes each of these men, each one of them, killed in the Battle of Badr. Each and every single one of them. They were killed in the battle of Badr. And so that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so these are only a few examples of how Quraysh would physically harm the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or attempt to harm him. There are other examples as well. And so we had Abu Lahab and his wife, who would also, not only verbally, but also physically harm the Prophet. And so the wife of Abu Lahab is mentioned in Surah Al Masad. That his wife, the wife of Abu Lahab, is the one who's going to be carrying firewood, meaning in the hellfire. In her neck is a rope, a twisted rope. And so it is said that the reason why she will have this punishment is because she would throw thorns in the path of the Prophet وسلم, where he would walk. So these are examples of how they would attempt to physically harm the Prophet And so among the lessons that we learned from this tactic and this method of Quraysh is number one, those who go through the most those who have it the roughest are the Anbiya, the Prophets and the Messengers of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, who are those who are tested and tried the most? And so he ﷺ said, Al Anbiya, the Prophets. Fal Amta Fal Amta. And then those nearest to them, those most like them, in their iman, in their you know, closeness to Allah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, a man is tried according to his deen. If he is firm in his deen, then his trials, the bala, is going to be even more severe. And if he is weak and frail in his deed, then he is tried according to the strength of his deed. And then he وسلم, said, the servant shall continue to be tried and tested by Allah until he is left walking upon the earth without any sins. And so what we learn from this hadith is that the prophets of Allah are those who have it the roughest. 
And the reason for that is because of how close they are to Allah. No other reason. So someone may think, if they are the closest to Allah, then shouldn't they have it the least? No. Because the wisdom behind and the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them and anyone else to go through such trials and tests is to purify them and to test them as we will see to test them to see who is true in his iman and who is not when these tests they start coming are you going to remain strong and continue or are you going to give up And so because the prophets and the messengers were the closest to Allah, Allah made them go through the most. The second lesson that we learned is what was the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making the Prophet وسلم, go through physical harm? We have seen Everything else that the Prophet ﷺ went through. Verbal abuse, character assassination, lies, distortions. They tried so much with him. But shouldn't physical abuse be something that Allah protected him from? The answer is that Allah did promise to protect the Prophet ﷺ from being killed. Allah did protect the Prophet ﷺ from that. So his enemies, they could do whatever they want, but they would never be able to assassinate him. As for physical harm, then the wisdom behind that could be that this was the sunnah of Allah. That victory and empowerment only comes after much trial and sacrifice. Victory and empowerment only comes after, after trial and sacrifice. If the Prophet ﷺ did not go through all of this, then then what should he deserve, you know, uh, victory in the end of the day? It is a sunnah of Allah that victory only comes through struggle and through sacrifice. Also, it could be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him to taste some of that which his companions were going through, which is what we're going to be looking at next. The Sahaba, عنهم, they went through a lot. A lot more physical harm than the Prophet وسلم. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him to taste what they were going through as well. And Allah is best. Finally, how did the Prophet وسلم, respond when he would be physically harmed in this way. We saw examples of that. Now, there are some people who, they don't mind being hurt. They don't mind being insulted or humiliated by others. They aren't sensitive at all. And this is not really a good trait to have. A Muslim is one who he doesn't let himself to be humiliated and disgraced, but rather he holds his head up high. The prophets of Allah, they held, they held a huge status. And they had dignity and respect among their people. So we cannot say that the prophet was was not sensitive. 
and he allowed himself to be humiliated in this way. No, rather, although he would get hurt, and you know it was painful to him what was happening to him, he did not let it to get in the way of his doubt. And so he chose to ignore. Because this was a tactic used by Quraysh, like other tactics, to try to distract him from his mission. To make him stop. To make him get sidetracked. And so he would not allow that to happen. And so he would not respond. He would not fight back. Instead, he would go on with his mission of giving down. And this was all being instructed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we can see in so many different ayat in the Quran. And so, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ وَهْجُرْهُمْ هَجْرًا جَمِيلًا Be patient, O Muhammad, with what they say. Let them say whatever they want to say. It's painful. It hurts. Let them say what they want to say. Be patient and keep away from them. Avoid them in a good way. They come in your face. They abuse you verbally, physically. Turn the other way. Avoid them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا وَاصْبِرْ وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ Be patient, O Prophet, for your patience is only with Allah's help. وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلِيهِمْ And do not grieve over these people. وَلَا تَكُوا فِي ضَيْقٍ مِمَّا يَمْكُرُوا Nor be distressed about what they plot and what they conspire. The point is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving him that tarbiyah to continue. Remain focused. Your mission is to give da'wah. And don't let these tactics to sidetrack you and to distract you from that mission. We move on to the next tactic that was used by Quraysh. And this is one of the most severe and it is the last one that we will cover. And it was persecution of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And so in the early days, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was accused. He was humiliated. He was ridiculed. He was insulted. He was physically harmed. But he was not persecuted. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was not tortured. Yes, there was physical harm, as we saw, but those were isolated cases. As for persecution and torture, this is something that he did not go through. And again, this was from Allah's protection for his Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Allah had protected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his uncle Abu Talib. Through his uncle Abu Talib. He was, he was his main support, as we mentioned previously. In fact, Ibn Kathir, he mentions that these incidents where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was harmed physically, the examples that we mentioned, were all after, or most of them were after, the death of Abu Talib. But while he was alive, he was his main defense. Because of his status, the status of Abu Talib among Quraysh. And his promise to support and defend the Prophet However, it was the followers of Muhammad who were persecuted and tortured. But these persecutions used to hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he cared 
for his companions. Now, the persecution of Quraysh did not only target the weak and the less powerful among the companions, like the slaves and the servants only. And this is what many people, they think. That it was only the less powerful who were tortured and persecuted. Yes, they were the ones who were the most brutally tortured. And they are the ones whose stories that we hear the most. But the reality is that almost all the early Muslims tasted some form of physical <coughs> torture or persecution, even those who were not powerless, even those who had some kind of status in Mecca and came from strong families, like Quraysh. And so among them was Abu Bakr, even he endured physical beating. And so once he was standing and giving da'wah by the Kaaba, and they jumped on him and they beat him until they thought he had almost died. Among them was also Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, who belonged to Banu Umayyah, who was from Quraysh. And so it is mentioned that his uncle would take him and wrap him in a carpet and then jump over him. And then there was also a Zubair ibn al Awam, also from Quraysh. His uncle would hang him in a carpet and burn fire under, and he would tell him to leave Islam. And he would say, No, I'm never going to leave Islam. As for those whose persecution was the most, they were, they were from the less powerful. They were either slaves and servants who had embraced Islam, whose masters remained upon kufr and did, and did not want them to embrace Islam, or they were not from Mecca. They happened to be from outside of Mecca. And so they did not have that tribal backing, that family support. And so among those who was tortured the most is, as we all know, Bilal radiallahu anhu. In fact, he was the strongest of the companions in the face of that persecution. And so the more they would persecute him, the stronger he would become. You know, imagine that. The more they would torture him, the stronger he would show resistance. When it's supposed to be the opposite. Because that is the whole point of the persecution. You know, th their whole purpose of doing this was to make the Muslims abandon their deen. And to make these Muslims an example for others who are considering accepting Islam that, look, if you accept Islam, then this is what's going to happen to you. So with Bilal, radiallahu anhu, it was the opposite. The more they were torturing him, the stronger he would become. And so he was later on asked, why was it that when, you're, when you were tortured, you would say, Ahadun Ahad. You know, they're telling you to disbelieve in Allah, and you're saying Allah is one. You're being tortured. And it's painful. And they're telling you to disbelieve in Allah. But you're responding back and saying, Ahad, Ahad, Allah is one. So Bilal radiallahu anhu, he said, because I found out that when I would say Allah is one, it would make them even more angry. This statement would anger them the most. And so this is why I would say, Ahad, Ahad. 
because he was happy to see that they were being enraged. He was happy to see that they were being enraged. He didn't care about his own suffering and his own pain. Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, narrates that the first people to, dec to declare Islam publicly were seven. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr, Ammar and his mother Sumayya, Suhaib al Rumi, Bilal and Miqdad. And then he said, with respect to the Messenger of Allah, Allah had protected him through his uncle Abu Talib. With respect to Abu Bakr, Allah protected him through his people. As for the rest, the Mushrikun seized them and made them to wear coats of iron and threw them in the desert, exposed to the intense heat of the sun. And then he said there was none of them who did not do what they wanted them to do except for Bilal. He said there was none among those Muslims who were being tortured who was told to say something except that they would say it under the persecution, under the torture. He said except for Bilal. He did not care what happened to him for the sake of Allah. And his people did not care what happened to him. Then they gave him to the children who took him around in the streets of Mecca while he was saying, Ahadun Ahadun. Then there was <coughs> Al Yasir, the family of Yasir, <coughs> who were tortured at the hands of Abu Jahl. Yasir was not from Mecca. He was from outside of Mecca. And he happened to be living in Mecca, residing in Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ openly started to preach Islam. And so he was one of those who embraced Islam, along with his wife, Sumayyah. So there was Yasir and his wife, Sumayyah, and their son, their son who? Who was their son? Ammar. And they had other children as well who had embraced Islam. So it is narrated that Abu Jahl would make the family of Yasir radiallahu anh, meaning him, his wife, and his children who had embraced Islam, to walk over hot coals. And they would make them, he would make them stake out in the sun at the hottest time. And so it is mentioned that the Prophet would pass by them. And he would see their suffering. And he would say to them, Sabran Be patient, O family of Yasir, for indeed. Your appointment is Jannah. Remain patient. Don't give up. Even if you're killed and martyred for this, because eventually I will meet you in Jannah. And so that's exactly what happened. Eventually, both Yasir and Sumayya, they were killed at the hands of Abu Jahl. And so it's, it's mentioned in one narration that Abu Jahl threw a spear in the private area of Sumayya, killing her instantly. As for Yasir, he was killed under torture. And so this is why it is mentioned that Sumayya radiallahu anha was the first martyr in Islam. She was the first one to die for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now all of this was a mental and physical torture for their son, 
Ammar radiyallahu anhu. Ammar was young. And so not only was he being tortured, so he's you know enduring physical physical torture, but on top of that, seeing both of his parents being tortured in this way and being killed eventually. And so Ammar radiallahu anhu under the torture, he buckled under this pressure, and he ended up speaking words of kufr. Because that is what? That is what his torturers were telling him to do. So he cursed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for, for them, because that's what they wanted. And they wanted him to praise their idols, so he did so. So later on, when he recovered from his pain, he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam full of grief. He was sad at what he did. And so he narrated to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what happened. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, how was your heart? You know, was your heart content with Iman? Or is what you said based on what was in your heart? And so he said, my heart was content with Iman. It, was, it didn't have any kufr. So it was with respect to him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ Allah says, whoever disbelieves in Allah after their iman, except those who are forced while their hearts are firm with iman. Allah says, however, those who embrace kufr wholeheartedly, then for them, Allah has condemned them and will make them to suffer a tremendous punishment. So basically those who say kufr with their hearts as well. And so the exception that Allah made is those who may say a word of kufr or do an act of kufr, but because they are forced to do it, they will not face any punishment. And so this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not overburden a person more than he can bear. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not bear a burden on us more than what we can bear. So there are certain circumstances when certain things which are otherwise haram become permissible in cases of necessity. In cases of Necessity. Out of necessity, we are permitted to do things which are otherwise haram. And so this is why the Prophet ﷺ told Ammar, he said to him, In aadu He said, if they torture you like that again, then you do the same thing that you already did. It's okay. If they torture you again and you can't bear the pain, say it. Say those words of kufr while your heart is at peace with Iman. And so there are so many stories of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum enduring all kinds of persecution and torture in those early days of Islam in Mecca. And all of that, the objective behind it was to weaken the Muslims, to make them to apostate and leave their deen, and to stop the spread of Islam. There are so many stories and we cannot mention all of them. The point here is to simply highlight that this was one of the tactics and the methods used by Quraysh to oppose the da'wah of the Prophet 
my lazy pussy. And so, among the lessons that we learned from this tactic is, first of all, <coughs> what was the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making the companions to go through this difficulty? This unbearable torture and persecution. The wisdom was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly was testing them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do the people think that they will be left alone to simply say, we believe in Allah, and then they will not be tested? Do you think that it's that easy? It's not. It's not that easy. If it was that easy, then everyone would embrace Islam. And then there would be no meaning behind the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for in this dunya. Why then would some people get Jannah and others won't? There has to be some kind of test. Just like if you want to see in school who will succeed and who won't. You have to give the students a test. Who is going to pass the test and who is going to fail the test. And then even among those who are going to pass, not all of them are equal. Some are going to pass with the highest mark. Others are barely going to pass. There has, there have to be, there has to be a standard by which you test them and you evaluate them, and then you reward them with grades. Likewise, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created us to test us, and He will reward us. Those who pass the test, they will be rewarded, but not all those who pass will pass at the same level. So that's why we have different ranks in Jannah. And we have different ranks of the believers, those who are close to Allah, those who are not that close to Allah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسِ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do the people think that they will be left to simply say, we believe in Allah, and then they will not be tested? وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Allah says, and we indeed tested those who came before them. Every prophet that Allah sent, they had followers, and Allah tested them too. This was not the first time. Allah is reminding the companions, this is not the first time. What you guys are going through is what? The followers of the prophets before he went through. So Allah wants to see who are those who are truthful in their in their claim to iman, and who are the liars. It's a test Allah wants to see who is truthful in their iman and who's fake. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them go through such difficulties and such hardships. Also, if the companions had it easy, how would they have managed later on the huge responsibilities of spreading the deen of Islam? And so there has to be this kind of tarbiyah from the beginning to prepare them for the great task that lies ahead after they make hijrah to Medina to establish a state and then to fight against the enemies and then after that to spread the deed of Allah. They wouldn't have been able to do any of that unless they went through hardship in the beginning. 
The second lesson that we learn is that the Sahaba عنهم, reached the status that they did because of their firm resolve. And so why is it that they are the best community to ever walk the face of the earth? The best human beings to walk the face of the earth are the, the Anbiya, the Prophets and the Messengers. After the Prophets and the Messengers, the best human beings to ever walk the face of the earth were the Sahaba of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How is it that they attained that status? And so even in the worst of circumstances, they did not cave in. They remained firm. They remained strong in the face of such persecution. And that's why the Prophet said, that the best of, of generations is my generation. Then those who follow them, then those who come after them. So how is it that they attained this status? This is one of the reasons. Because in the face of such persecution and hardship, they did not cave in. They did not give up. They did not abandon Rasulullah They didn't say, if this is how difficult it's going to be, then, you know, I can't handle it. I'm leaving. No. They stood with him in difficult times. And so what we learn from this is that if that was how the companions were, and they remained firm in such hardships, then how about us? When we are going through nothing compared to what they went through. So why is it that some of us today, you know, give up so easily? The kind of the kinds of tests that Allah is testing us with is nothing compared to the kinds of tests that they faced. And so they are an example for the rest of the Ummah. That whatever you are going through is nothing compared to what they went through. If they remained strong and firm in that, then what excuse do you have for not remaining strong and firm? Finally, how did Rasulullah react to the suffering of his companions that he witnessed in front of his own eyes and that would be a cause of grief for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu alayhi who was one of the companions who also went through a lot. He was one of the youth, one of the young ones, and he was also one of the powerless. He was not from the, you know, the, 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 the powerful families and tribes. In fact, he was one of the slaves. And so it mentions that he went to Rasulullah while Rasulullah was sitting at the Kaaba, leaning his back towards the Kaaba. He walked up to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Ala Tadrulana, Ala Tastosulana, O Messenger of Allah, will you not make dua for us? Will you not ask Allah to give us victory? That's all he said. But what did his statement imply? And why is it that the Prophet ﷺ reacted the way he did? That's all he said. What this statement implies is that we're going through Severe hardship. You know, 
well, we can't handle it anymore. So ask Allah to make it easy for us, to ease the pain, to end all of this. And Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu, you know, uh, look at what he went through. Later on, in the days of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when Umar was the Khalifa, he was sitting with some of the old companions who were some of the first Muslims. He was sitting among them and he asked each one of them to share their experiences in Mecca. You know, what is it that you went through in those early days of Islam? So each one of them would tell, would share their stories. When the turn came for Khabbab to speak, he didn't say anything. All he did was he lifted his shirt and he exposed his back. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he said, I have never seen anything like this. What happened? And so Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu he says that when I was in Mecca Quraysh would bring rocks and burn them over fire until they turned red and then they would lay these rocks in the desert on the on the hot sand and then they would take me and throw me on top of these rocks and so what Umar had seen were deep holes in his back Khabab said so these rocks would burn through my flesh and I would hear the burning of my flesh and I could even smell some of the burning And so Khabbab ibn Arat radiallahu anhu, he had something to complain about to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But now, what was the reaction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He could have raised his hand and started to make dua. After all, he is al-Ra'uf al-Rahim. He is the most compassionate. Bil Mu'minina Rahufun Rahim. That towards the believers he is compassionate and kind. You think he doesn't care about their suffering? Of course he does, and it grieved him a lot. But look at the response of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was leaning against the Kaaba, he sat up straight, and his face turned red. And this would only happen when he would become angry. And then he said, there would be a believer among those who came before you, among the past nations. There would be a believer who would be taken and his flesh would be combed with iron combs. And, that, and it would separate his flesh and his nerves from his bones. But it would never cause him to abandon his deed. And they would bring one of them and place a saw on top of their head, splitting them and cutting them into two. And that would also not cause them to abandon and give up their deed. Then the Prophet said, in the name of Allah, Allah will give victory to this deen. Allah will give victory to this deen until a traveler will go from Sana'a all the way to Hadramaut, fearing none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, what can we learn from this hadith? <coughs> First of all, The reaction of Rasulullah in this way to Khabbab ibn al-Arat 
was not because he didn't care about what they were going through. It was not because he couldn't make dua, but because he sensed that they were starting to give up. He sensed that now they're starting to lose their resolve. They're no longer standing firm. And so what he wanted was for them to learn that it's not over yet. It's not yet over. Continue to remain firm and steadfast. Continue to be patient, even though we are going through a lot. Do not give up. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laws. Just like there are laws in nature, in the universe around us. Just like there are laws for the various sciences. Likewise, there are laws of Allah with respect to his deed and with respect to victory and empowerment. And the law with respect to that is the only way to achieve it is through, as we mentioned earlier, through hardship, through sacrifice. And so we have to go through all the various stages. We can't jump a stage and we can't jump to the end until we have gone through the various stages that will lead to that victory. And so the Prophet was telling them that look, Victory is coming, but it requires for us to continue, not to give up. And so Rasulullah gave them, gave him the example of what happened to the Muslims of the past nations. He wanted his ummah to be the best ummah. If the people before were patient, then he wanted his ummah to be even more patient. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wanted his ummah to be the best. And his ummah would be the best. The companions would end up being the best. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wants to see us on the Day of Judgment as being the largest. And he wants to be proud of us. And so he said in one hadith that, you know, he wants us to marry and multiply in numbers so that he is proud of our numbers on the Day of Judgment when he sees us. Thirdly, Rasulullah says at the end of the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will complete this deen and, and grant victory to Islam until a travel a traveler will travel from Sana'a to Hadramaut, fearing none but Allah and fearing the wolf with respect to his herd of sheep. How come Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam living in Mecca chose these two places? How come he mentioned two places in Yemen that was not relevant to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum? And so there's something interesting in this choice of, of his example that he gave. Yemen used to be a very tribal society, and it still is until today. Very tribal. And in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu that whole area was covered by armed tribes. Rival tribes who would always be fighting against one another. And some of those tribes were even known among all the Arabs in Arabia to be bandits and, you know, to, to be corrupt and to be you know, uh, warriors. And so when Islam would come to them, 
the Prophet said that the whole area would become peaceful. A traveler can travel from Sana'a to Hadramaut, not fearing anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what this teaches us is that with Islam comes peace. And without Islam, there will never be peace. Once Islam comes and rules, then there will be true peace. Until then, there will never be peace. And this is what history has taught us. From that time until today, whenever Islam had the upper hand, there was always peace and security. If you ever went anywhere in the Muslim world, when Islam is no longer ruling, that is when we see bloodshed. And that is when we see what we see in this day and age. And so with that, we come to the end of this tactic that was used by Quraysh of uh, persecution. In conclusion, there were other tactics and methods that were used by Quraysh. But we're not going to really mention them because they're going to come. And so, for example, they tried to place an economic embargo on the Muslims. And that will come later on of how three years there was this economic embargo on the Muslims. No one was allowed to trade with them. Also among their tactics that they used was after the Muslims had migrated to Abyssinia, which is basically the next topic that we're going to talk about next week, inshallah. It was not enough for Quraysh. You know, even though the Muslims had left, Quraysh sent a delegation to Najashi and started putting pressure on him. Send these people back. Also among the tactics that they would use was that after they failed in their character assassination of the Prophet وسلم, they tried to assassinate the character. And so they tried to assassinate the Prophet And once again, this is something that will come later on when we come to the Hijrah to Medina and the story of how they tried to assassinate the Prophet Wasallam. And so the attempts were made by Quraysh to put out the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They tried everything that they could, but they failed. They tried to assassinate him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Allah would protect him. And they tried all of these various methods and tactics, but each and every single one of them that we have looked at failed. And they did not achieve their objectives. And this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect his deen and that not only do the enemies of Islam try to put out the light of Allah but that whenever they do so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only perfects his light. And so this is what we saw in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is what we see throughout our history and even in today's day and age. That whenever the enemies of Islam come and try to put out the light of Allah and stop the spread of Islam, Islam only becomes stronger. And there are so many examples of that. And so let them do whatever they want. None of their attempts will succeed. And so this is Basically, what we will be mentioning uh, next week, we'll move on to, as I mentioned, 
the first hijra. And that was to Al Habasha, to Abyssinia. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, grant us knowledge of his deen and to allow us to love his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa salli allahumma wa sallim ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.